Welcome, everybody. Um, I'm excited to see people interested in learning about some crinoids. Uh, just out of curiosity, how many people know what crinoids are? Excellent. You guys are going to learn so much. Uh, these are one of my favorite animals on the planet, um, and they are related to animals you do know. So you guys are going to hopefully uh, learn a little bit and be excited as by crinoids as I am by the end. To start, can I get a volunteer? Um, I need someone, or I would like someone, I don't need someone, to hold this up just for as long as possible. We're going to time you, see how long you can hold it in the air. Anyone want to give it a shot? Yeah? OK. So when your arm gets tired, let me know, and I'll stop the timer. The record is 45 seconds. So let's see if you can uh, best that. All right, ready, set. And go. All right. So, um, and the reason we're doing this in part is because we're going to talk about some special features that crinoids have today um, that you guys will learn about that we don't have. Let's see if I can get this work. So, one thing I am going to start off is if anyone wants to take a guess of what this is, we'll come back to it later. So, don't worry if you're like, I have no idea. The blob from some horror film. Yeah, that's actually pretty accurate. You know, the slime from Dungeons and Dragons or something like that. Any other thoughts? Tar. That's a good one. Say so. We'll come back to this later. Just want you to keep this in mind um, as we're going through. I'm going to steal this mouse actually, so I don't have to keep walking back to the computer. All right. So the group of animals we are talking about today are called Echinodermata. And Echinodermata is a phylum of animals uh, which you, if you've ever gone snorkeling or you like the beach, um, you've seen some of them. You're likely familiar with sea stars or maybe brittle stars, sea urchins. Some of you may know sea cucumbers. Uh, but the one that a lot of people don't know, he's switching hands. <laughs> it's okay, that's not bad. It's gonna say a minute and 10, so he's our new record. Yeah. Yeah, you wanna try? Yeah, you can hand it to her. I'll have her try. All right. So you're just going to hold it straight up for as long as you can. Set and go. All right. And this is hard for all, everyone who's not trying it. I can, I can guarantee it's hard. This is actually an exercise ballerinas will do, where they're supposed to hold for as long as possible in various positions. Uh, but going back to kind of terms for a second, just because this isn't to talk about ballerinas today, uh, this is the group that most people don't know. These are crinoids. Um, and they have been on Earth for a really, really long time. In fact, they're one of the oldest group of animals on the Earth. We're talking about 450 million years on the planet. Um, so this is what they look like today. Um, this is a photograph that was taken a few years ago by uh, one of my colleagues on one of my deep sea trips. And this is a picture of a fossil um, from about 300 million years ago. So you can see they're actually relatively similar. And that allows us to do something really special um, that a lot of other paleontology workers don't get to do as quite as easily, which is we can actually look at the ones in the modern and use certain things about them to assess what was going on in the past. Um, and that's a lot of where my research focus is on. I'm a traditionally trained paleontologist, so I spend a lot of time digging in the dirt. But I also spend a lot of time uh, doing work in today's oceans and kind of looking for analogies to that I can apply backwards. And a key one for this is what is the basic morphology, or in this case, that's a way of saying the body plan of a crinoid. Uh, we call this area the crown. This is what they use to feed. They are super exciting feeding creatures. They just sit there like this. Something falls on them. They stuff it down into their mouth, and they go back to this. So you know, super, super exciting. It's the laziest way to eat. You done? Oh, not bad at all. I'm going to say one minute and 47. Wow. Yeah. All right. It's going to say, so simplistic in their form is basically how we started to view them, especially since bef until we found these in the uh, oceans, which was about 150 million years ago, we thought we only had them in fossil form. But this is kind of the analogies we were making. We said they have a crown, they have a stalk, which they you know, rest on. And then they have these little things called cirri, which we won't talk about too much today. Um, we're actually going to mostly focus on the stock. And the reason is for this, when we saw these in the fossil record, we said, OK, crown, stock, probably not all that. You know, If you saw this, a lot of people, they think of a plant. 
In fact, today we call them sea lilies. Plant is really where our brain goes. They don't do much, they sit there, they eat. Um, and recent work has shown that's not quite the case. There's actually a whole group of them that lose their stock and swim. Um, so they're very mobile. And uh, these guys are great. We call them feather stars, incredibly beautiful. You can find them if you ever go to the Philippines. They're everywhere. You'll be thinking you're swimming over a bunch of plants. You're actually swimming over a bunch of these. Uh, but they're actually worldwide as well. Um, so you can find them in a lot of places. Less well known is that only recently, this was actually work done by my advisor here, is that the ones with the stalk can use their arms to pull themselves along the ground. Now, if that doesn't look like a good Halloween creature for you, you know, <laughs> you go into a dark alley and you find that coming at you, I'll be turning around. Well, I won't be. I'll keep going all excited because I think it's a crinoid on land. But you guys might run, and I would not blame you. So this has kind of made us had to reassess what their abilities are and what they can do. So going back to, you know, kind of how we think about doing things, we've now discovered that they're actually able to do a lot of stuff using their crown. That's because their crown has muscle. Um, who here has some muscle? Yeah, I was going to say, you know, if you flex, you might see a little bit of a bulge. That's some good muscle there. You're standing, or if you're sitting, then you're using all of your leg muscles. All of you actually have really decent posture, so you guys are, are using a, a little bit of your abs and a little bit of your back muscles there. So muscles are really important to us, um, and they're basically how we do everything. I'm standing here. I'm holding two objects in my hand. That's very careful musage, muscle usage. Um, but they're critical for our success as humans, our muscles. And in fact, if you think of almost any animal that we think of extraordinary feats, muscle is a huge player in this. So when we get to the crinoids, we say, okay, so their crowns have muscle. Are their stalks, do they have muscle? Because that's the next big thing. Um, when you become an animal that has two major pieces that you can kind of define, you want to know if, okay, if you're in the water column, can you bend this way, can you bend that way? Are you able to do things that you want? And it turns out there's no muscle in the stock. So because of this, people said, OK, they can use their, ar their arms on the crown for stuff, but their stock is basically useless. It can be pushed one way by the ocean, um, but it can't actively bend into that position. And this becomes important for the paleontological record because this is one of the biggest arguments that comes up in the paleontological record. We have some really weird crinoids, like this one. This is Ammonia crinus. And people have been arguing for years over this guy. Do, the kind of thought is that he curls up, and then he actually flexes in and out and kind of creates his own water current for himself. And people have you know, done a lot of work. They say, has to have muscle, no muscle, has to have muscle, no muscle. You can get, if you get a room full of uh, paleontologists who work on crinoids, and it really would be a tiny room, unfortunately. Um, but people you know, yell, it has muscle you would hear an argument start immediately. This is a big controversy in our group. Um, so a lot of people have come back and forth on the project. And so one of the things people did was, is there another option? I told you these stocks have ligaments. Uh, how many people know what a ligament is? That's pretty good. Um, and how many people know how your ligaments work? Mostly, yeah. Um, so ligaments in vertebrates, which is like us, are actually, when you break the ligament down to its finest pieces, all of what we call the, the segments in it are all of the same length. And you can stretch them to do various things. In fact, just doing this, I'm stretching ligaments. Um, and the really great thing, though, is when you stop stretching them, they snap back into place. So our ligaments work like a rubber band, assuming, and I can see some laughter out there, so I know who's like torn their ACL immediately. <laughs> yeah, it's going to say you can actually snap it too far. Uh, but in general, we hope our ligaments work like a rubber band and come back to a position we like. Now, echinoderms actually do something weird. It turns out all of their fibers are of different lengths. And this means they actually can do some really cool things. They can actually slide them apart and uh, become really lengthy. And they can also build bonds between them and become really stiff, like a mesh. So when we think of these two different states, we call them the loose and the catch state. Um, and they can go between these states at will and really, really fast. They can do this in seconds. So I showed you this photo, remember? It's a what? That's the stretching. Yeah, this is a sea cucumber. And it, it did survive this process. 
um, sort of. I mean, it didn't do do great after, and it did eventually uh, die. But I mean, it's actually they'll do a lot of stuff like this and things. This is their very loose state, and they did this project on sea cucumbers because sea cucumbers have no hard parts in them. They're not like sea urchins, which have a nice hard bit in them. So it'd be really hard to pull a sea urchin apart. Uh, but these guys, they actually pulled it completely, um, and they also show it here in its uh, stiff stage. Um, how, how many guys have ever gone snorkeling and seen a sea urchin? Sorry, sea cucumber. Some people. Have you, did you guys poke them? No. Well, next time, that's because you take this your, your homework for 50 years, 25 minutes from now. Whenever you go snorkeling, you see a cucumber, or when you're at an aquarium and there's a touch tank, poke the sea cucumber. They'll actually go stiff because it's a defense. So they'll actually create bonds and go really, really stiff. And these skills... These, we call them mutable collagenous tissues, which is a really fancy way of saying their ligaments can change their own, own properties. They can go from a soft state to a hard state. And all, all groups of echinoderms can do this. So we know for crinoids specifically, this is used for posture. Um, so here is actually a bunch of crinoids that are about all the same size, the crown's all the same, and they're all under the same water current, but immediately you can see they're all in different positions. It's so like if we got a really big windstorm, I had you guys all go outside and push against the wind. We might end up in different positions as well, but it's our muscles that affect that. For these guys, what they actually do is they'll let their crown catch the current, get to a position they like, and then they'll stiffen all their ligaments. And they're done. That's it. So when we were, when we were doing our experiment with our um, one minute and 47 second record now um, of holding something in the air, we have to use energy to get it up there, and we have to use energy to hold it there. Crinoids are actually, once they're in a position they want, they expend no energy. They just stiffen everything. They work, that they're done. It's the best, laziest way ever. Remember I said food drops on them? Well, now you know they don't even have to do anything to hold that position. They just stiffen all their ligaments. The other really great thing they use this for is uh, uh, something we call autotomy, which is basically losing a piece of your body. Um, and for crinoids, they can actually just, if they see a predator, it's most often used for predators, they'll chop off their own arm. And they'll just kind of leave it floating, and hopefully, just like a lizard's tail, that predator will go for the uh, arm instead of them, and they'll actually survive the whole thing. Um, and they can do this in part because they are amazing regeneration abilities. They can regenerate from everything um, and have no injury. And you hear this all the time, you know, cut a starfish in half. It might grow back into two. And that's a true story. They can do that, actually. Um, and all echinoderms are really, really good at regeneration. So they can actually lose whole pieces of their body. They also do a bunch of other crazy stuff. I'll just give you a quick overview. Sea cucumbers, again, can actually spit up their entire insides. So they'll throw out their own stomach, and then they'll let the predator eat that, and they chop it off themselves. So they loosen their bodies to be able to spit it out. Then they stiffen to snap it. I know, it's... it's it is so weird. Um, I was going to say, kind of, would you believe me if I told you that, so we're vertebrates. Echinoderms are actually our closest, fi closest phylum. You're closer related to a sea cucumber than you are an octopus. That, that's your fact you can take home today. <laughs> when you think of a sea cucumber spitting up its own guts. <laughs> yeah, we, we and the echinoderms uh, uh, broke off la er, earlier from the groups than the rest of them. So... Yeah, these are our closest relatives right here. Sea, sea stars also expel their stomachs to wrap around stuff. Um, sea urchins also use these ligaments for special skills. They'll, when they see a predator, and I use the term sea loosely because they don't have eyes, but there's some evidence they can see light. Um, they actually will stiffen their spines so it becomes like taking a pole and jabbing it into the ground so they're ready for what's ever coming. And these are all different things they use these skills for. So the question then goes back to this original thing is, are the stalks passive? We see that they can stiffen and loosen these ligaments, but can they bend like muscles? That's a real question that people basically dismissed immediately because as far as we're aware, muscle and this cell call, you know, this myosin which we use in muscles, they're all important for contraction. And for us, if they're, they're not there, you don't contract, you don't bend, you can't actively bend. Um, but this does ask for some weird questions. If you stretch a ligament out of position to get to this new position, how does it go back? Because now you're in this very loose state. 
How do you kind of shove it back to the same state it was before? Um, and that's a question that surprisingly, which is something that can happen with uh, paleontologists, we didn't have an answer for, so everyone just stopped talking about it. <laughs> we just ignored it. We're like, eventually we'll figure that out. But for the moment, let's just pretend like it doesn't exist. Um, and this is, oh, is it working? There we go. About the time I come in. I work on a group of crinoids called Brigetocrinids. Um, and if you guys want to say that 10 times fast, it took me about four or five months to get it right. And there was a lot of crying from my advisor because I would be in a lab meeting. He goes, how is it going with the Brigetocrinids? And I'm like, well, the Brigetocrinids. And he's like, Brigetocrinids. I'm like, Brigetocrinids. And he's like, come on, you're just messing with me because I would forget it all the time. But these are what I work on. Um, and they're cool little guys. We're going to talk about them pretty much for the rest of this talk, so I hope you enjoy them as much as I do. They're actually really small. They're about this tall. Um, unlike other crinoids, they have very few arms, um, and their stalk is rooted in the sediment as well. Um, so they don't pull themselves along the ground the way that the one I showed you earlier was, and they can't swim as well. Um, and I work with these guys off of Roatan, Honduras. So... Rotan, Honduras is a very special place for two reasons. One, my crinoids are there. And two, um, there's this nutcase, Carl Stanley, uh, who built a submarine in his backyard, and he'll take tourists down. So those are the two critical por portions to be able to uh, work in Honduras that I needed. Um, this is actually one of my colleagues, Dr. Chuck Messing. Um, and this is my advisor after six hours in the sub with me. So you can see I'm really excited about that, and he's just more or less hoping that we can get out. It's a very small... Small space, you're kind of like shoved in there like this, and you're like, this is okay, this is okay. Um, I ho you have to like the person you go down with because it's six hours, no bathroom, no water. Y you basically are hunched. Um, this is about as much space as we had entirely. Um, yeah, but you could, I mean, it's pretty fun. I've taken my mom down. I did tell her beforehand it was built in someone's backyard, but I didn't the first time I went down. I was like, yeah, it's fine. It's professional, government made. Um, we've had a few emergency backups, but it's usually rare. He's actually, the pilot's pretty skilled, and he's never lost anyone yet, mostly because he'd be lost with them. But what do we do in this sub? Well, people ask me this question a lot, and they go, oh, do you have claws on the front? Um, like, do you manipulate stuff? We have a plywood board, which we put a hook on, and this is a very dramatic moment that actually started a whole chapter in my dissertation. Um, we don't need to hear us uh, screaming as we're trying to do this. So this is our fancy board on the fans front of our fancy sub, and it has a hook on it. And this all came around as a question I asked my advisor was, if we uprooted one of these crinoids, could it reroot itself? And he looked at me and said, well, that's a silly question. Of course they can't. And then there was a long pause, and he goes, no, actually, I'm wrong. That's not a silly question because no one's proven it either way. So we'll do that. He's like, for you, we'll uproot this crinoid. So I terrorized this poor crinoid. I uprooted it. A very, well, I like Carl uprooted it. I put the board on. Um, but so you can see here, we've actually knocked it over and it's now lying on the sediment. So what nobody expected to happen was we came back to a day later and the crinoid had actually begun to upright itself from the sediment. And honestly, I, I've been told by my advisor I'm never allowed to show the video of the time where, it wa where we first saw this, mostly because it's him swearing and going, you can't do that, that's impossible, because this more or less contradicted what we thought about crinoid stems. They shouldn't be able to do anything without an external force. Something else has to affect them for them to do something. So there is, it really is like he just lost his stuff. He lost it. It was great. I was going, oh, I knew nothing at that point about crinoid stocks, so I didn't even realize how exciting this was, and I was like, yeah, cool. <laughs> it did something, um, but I learned very quickly. So the first question we had to ask was, okay, what happened? Were we wrong? Was there muscle in the stock? Was it something else? Were they actually just really able to float? So the crown might be really light, so it just floats upwards. Could they actually wave their arms fast enough to generate enough to lift off the sediment. Um, similarly, could they use a kite idea? Could they actually catch the current and kind of pull themselves back into position? And we actually got through this pretty quickly when it came to this. We looked at the recent studies, no muscles in the stock. That's an easy throw out. The buoyancy is um, something that was proposed by one researcher 
Um, and we more or less were able to disprove by actually repeating the experiment. Yeah, that's right, I knocked over more crinoids. I'm their worst predator down there to some extent. Um, and they didn't raise at similar speeds. They all eventually did, but some of them raised really slowly. We also found no evidence of any soft tissues that might be really buoyant. So we ruled that one out. Uh, the swimming, turns out that their stalk is so heavy, they cannot generate enough with their arms to lift themselves up. And similarly, there was actually no current across the days we were looking. Um, so we, it was such a short period of time, we didn't document any current, there was no disturbances in the sediment that we were looking at, and we did the same thing. We calculated exactly how fast the current would have needed. And that's about 20 centi centimeters per second, which is not an insignificant current. That's actually fast enough to remove small particles from the sand. So we were able to go, yeah, it's none of these. So this got us back to, could it have been the ligaments? Because remember, we know the ligaments can change their properties, but we don't think that they can actually actively act like muscles. And if so, why did we never see on any of other the crinoids people have worked on? Well, there's one final thing that's really important about brigetocrinids, and that is they have a kind of articulation, um, which is basically when you stack the uh, stalk, which is made of all these little hard parts, they actually have a ridge on every level. And that ridge has a space across it. And those are two very critical things if you want to have active bending. Um, if anyone's ever, you know, sh uh, tried to lift a rock or something where you stick actually a lever, kind of a lever under it and then you push down, you're creating this kind of system. If you have that space to bend across, you can actually do this. And brigetocrinids and a few other crinoids are the only ones that have this. The rest of them all have uh, kind of the articulation where it's either flat on flat, so you don't see anything, or they're interlocking. So they can be pulled out of position and then, such as when they're in the position for feeding, and then they could actually re-pull back. But you wouldn't see bending in a normal system. So this gets us back to, do we see this in the fossil record? Um, so I'm going to first show you uh, the platycrinids, which are one of my favorites, and I have some up here today. Um, they have this same kind of interlocking uh, synarthro articulation is what we call it. And they also are really twisted in their stem. So this would, sh and that's because the ridge actually rotates where it is in the stem. So that means they could bend in a lot of different directions. Uh, so this all goes with the idea that if you have this type, you might do active bending. And getting us back to the beginning, here's this guy again, where people argued over the muscle. And you notice it's got that ridge as well. So maybe it didn't need muscle. It might not be as fast using the ligaments, but it certainly could have used the ligaments. I did say, suggest this to to Gorslak, and I got a little bit of a look, so. <laughs> he, he's not totally so sold yet, but. It's true. So it's also really important when we look back into the arms. So I've now hopefully convinced you that their ligaments may be responsible for this kind of movement in the stock, but I also want to say that there was about, you know, a couple hundred million years that crinoid arms didn't have muscles in them, and yet eh, they were still able to do a lot or at least we think they might have been able to. And they might have actually been able to also use these ligaments in a similar way. Um, and this changes where we think they can sit in their environment um, and how we view kind of the systems they were working in versus today where they just use a lot of muscle. And they're actually, they, they move pretty quick. So it's so a final photo I'm gonna show you guys here. Here's Brigetta Krinus in a bunch of different positions. It's actually a little crab up there too, waving. Um, they do a lot, and I've worked on them for about five years now, and you'll see them in a bunch of different positions. Um, we've knocked over a ton of them. Uh, <laughs> they've all survived. I can honestly say every crinoid I have shown you here today survives. No crinoids were harmed in the making of this talk. I have another talk where we harmed some, if you ever want to come to that, um, and I can't say the same thing there. But here I can honestly say that these experiments showed us that not only do they seem to have some sort of active bending going on, um, even in the absence of muscle, but that they're really resilient to being knocked over with a stick. So can I answer any questions for you guys?